Ignition. not an actual Gemini mission. Nobody left the ground. Gemini did not abort. We have simply edited together an isolated launch with shots of the flight controllers simulating that launch. The flight was simulated from an adjacent room in the Mission Control Center, Houston, and like many other things in the space age, flight simulation is done by computers. The primary and backup crew for Gemini 8 will undergo 11 days of such simulated flights before launch day, March 16th. Early in the program, experts sit down and analyze the Gemini 8 flight. They know it is a three-day mission. Its primary purposes include rendezvous in space with an Agena target vehicle, the first docking in space, and a two-hour spacewalk by pilot David Scott. The experts then devise problems that could occur. Some simple, some quite challenging. They feed these problems into a computer and sit back and see what happens, perhaps with a little glee. At any rate, the crew in the simulator and the controller at the console are given the problem. Both must respond correctly. About 90 problems will be run for the Gemini 8 mission. On the schedule are two days devoted to the Agena target vehicle. Four days devoted to network simulations and two days scheduled for running re-entry simulations, including emergency re-entries. Eleven days of problem solving. Most probably none of them would turn up during the flight. But if one should, the crew and the 5,000 people in the ground network that support these two men would be ready. Several days before Gemini 8 will leave the ground, the USS Boxer steams toward the primary recovery zone where the mission will normally end. It begins training its complement of officers and men in recovery operations. Instead of launching amphibious strike missions, the Boxer now launches helicopters for search and retrieval of astronauts. On board is the commander of the Western Atlantic Recovery Forces, known as Task Force 140.3. Two ships, six helicopters, and six aircraft are assigned to this task force. All five manned Gemini flights to date have been recovered as planned in the primary zone. Still, 10 more 54 aircraft and 5,000 additional men will be deployed at different stations around the world for recovery. There are nine other planned landing areas lying within the three major zones of the Eastern Atlantic, the Mid-Pacific, and the Western Pacific. 
In the western Pacific, the USS Leonard F. Mason, a destroyer, begins exercises on the retrieval of a boilerplate model of the Gemini spacecraft. The Mason will cover three landing areas within Zone 3. It will be backed up by aircraft from Okinawa and Japan. The chief difference between the primary area where the boxer is stationed and a secondary area such as this is the comprehensiveness of coverage, the number of aircraft, ships, and recovery specialists on station. In addition, a special launch abort area covers the landmass and immediate offshore areas at Cape Kennedy. Recovery teams go out before the astronauts enter the spacecraft in case of an ejected abort from the launch pad or shortly after liftoff. There could be more extreme contingencies. The emergency might be such that a spacecraft could not land in a planned landing area. In a dire emergency, the command pilot might have to fire the retro rockets and come right down. Bare statistics come into play here. The world is 70% water and 30% land. The odds are strongly weighted toward a water landing. Aircraft are stationed at 12 points to locate the spacecraft in this emergency. Any commercial shipping in the area might then be called for assistance to pick up the astronauts. Freighters, oilers, tankers, any ship with heavy hoist equipment could also take the spacecraft aboard. If the crew comes down over land, they would use the ejection seats, leave the spacecraft, and land by parachute. Astronauts have not only a complete survival kit to sustain them, but they are trained to live off the land, even desert and jungle. Whether Gemini comes down over water or land, recovery is planned and coordinated by a NASA team of specialists. They set up the requirements for a mission and work closely with the Department of Defense. DOD then commits the necessary ships and aircraft to do the job. The DOD manager for manned spacecraft support directs worldwide recovery forces. He is in contact with two main elements under his command, the Atlantic Recovery Control Center, Cape Kennedy, and the Pacific Recovery Control Center, Hawaii. The red telephone puts him into direct contact with the highest levels of the Department of Defense for further assistance. But all of this, the red telephone and the contingency aircraft off Pago Pago Island, South Pacific, seems remote on the 16th of March. The crew is entering their spacecraft for what has every sign of being a normal flight. At the same time, on Launch Complex 14, the Atlas Agena count is only 25 minutes from liftoff. The Gemini mission is largely based on a successful orbit of the target vehicle. The Agena count has no holes. Right on the nose, at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, the Atlas launch vehicle ignites. has three main propulsion engines which ignite at liftoff. Two are booster engines and one is a sustainer engine. The booster engines cut off first, some two minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. The sustainer engine then takes over and propels the Agena to an altitude of 654,190 feet. Two small vernier engines on the Atlas continue to position the Agena properly in the later phases of launch. They cut off at five minutes, six seconds after liftoff. The Agena propulsion system then inserts the target vehicle into a circular orbit. Today, the flight plan calls for a circular orbit of 161 nautical miles. Something close to that would be acceptable. The Agena propulsion system can be started from the ground and a burn completed to change the orbit. But as the final figures come up to the flight dynamics officer, no in-flight burns will be needed. Agena has hit the planned circular orbit of 161 nautical miles. This is a good beginning for any rendezvous flight. The news is given the crew by the spacecraft communicator. Pilot Scott comes back with just what the doctor ordered. The flight director now calls for launch of Gemini 8 at 11.40 and 59 seconds Eastern Standard Time. Offshore, the launch site recovery forces are fully deployed. They now can only wait like the rest of us. Stage two pre valves coming open, five seconds. T e minus 20 seconds, mark.
Liftoff came as Flight Director Hodge had requested, 11.40 and 59 seconds. Gemini 8 goes into the clouds high above Cape Kennedy. As the spacecraft comes out of the clouds, an aerial chase plane picks it up for a close look at what it's like to ride as a spacecraft crew on top of a booster. After 50 seconds, the crew releases the restraints which are required for seat ejection. Gemini 8 was inserted into an orbit of 86 nautical miles by 146 nautical miles, very close to the planned values of 86 by 145 nautical miles. The launch site aboard is the first contingency that has passed successfully. A carefully trained team has been released and returns to other duties. With two good orbits, target vehicle and spacecraft, Gemini 8 had a head start on rendezvous and docking. The maneuvers for rendezvous would be essentially the same as those performed by Gemini 6. So fast does the space program accelerate that rendezvous was the primary objective of Gemini 6 in December. But three months later, it is March, and rendezvous almost seems routine. Everyone is focused more on docking, everyone except those who fly the mission. Then you take things step by step. <laughs> 